Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of our Live Sound webinars. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, going into the subject of mixing for orchestras and broadcast. We have uh, some of the world's most renowned experts in that field. Uh, but before we go there, I would like to uh, explain a couple of household rules. Um, the audio and video for the attendees is disabled, so um, you cannot uh, interactively use your audio or video. So uh, as well as the chat is disabled as well, but there is a Q&A section which you can use to ask questions. So there will be an interactive part where we will allow for um, some questions from the attendees to be addressed by the panel members, right? Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to our host for the webinar, Mr. Rob Allen. Rob, uh, over to you to present the panel members to us. Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, great to have everybody here. Thanks for attending. This is something like the sixth webinar that we, Chris and I have done since the lockdown. So, yeah, let's address the elephant in the room before we start. Um, so let's, I'm going to go around with you one at a time and find out what, what you're up to the moment. Karsten, uh, I guess there's, we're not doing live concerts at the moment. So, so what are you up to in the lockdown? Are you busy? Are you working? Um, yes, I am. Uh, lucky wise, um, <laughs> more or less, I have two prof uh, professions. So I'm a professor at the University of Applied Science as well. And we are in our very last week of this summer term. And yeah, I'm lucky that I have that work. And besides that, I was a recording. Uh, an orchestra two uh, two weeks ago, of course, all with social distances. Wow, how do, how do you socially distance in an orchestra? That's tricky, right? Yeah, yeah, I can say uh, delaying microphones does not work with, <laughs> within that situation. <laughs> yeah, bet. yeah, okay. So who else we got? Jose Luis, good to see you. Bienvenido. Um, where are yeah. you? Are, are you in Madrid? I'm in Madrid. Yeah. Are, are um, you working? Yeah. Thankfully, yeah, I'm working, working. mixing uh, a film. I'm working in, uh, in a new film that is coming in September. So okay, I have some work to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, so, so Jose, you, you, you mix, you mix films, you mix broadcast, you mix artists live with orchestra. So you're, you kind of, you do a whole bunch of things as well. So I, you, you're lucky in that you can, you can use different skills during the lockdown, right? Yeah, so, it can switch so. to, to something to from one thing to another. But the thing is that right now I don't have any live events. I think in August I have one in right. um, I think in Malaga. But right now the thing, the good thing is I can do studio work. So that's, that's a, right. a wonderful thing. And Mark, where where are you? You're based in New York, but are you there now? No, I'm based in New York and London, but right now I'm in Italy, um, and I'm. Like Jose Luis, I do studio and live. So right now I'm just doing mixing from home, basically lots of remote mixing. Right. Okay. That's, a, that's nice that you can, you're can you able to do that. Yeah. And Timo, greetings. How are you? Hi. Up from, Hi from the, the frozen north, but it's not frozen right now. It's beautiful out there right now, I'd say. Yeah. Finland. Uh, yeah so, so Timo, you, you have a really beautiful OB truck. Um, so we're going to talk with you more about broadcasting, orchestra mixing. Uh, um, is the truck? Are you out? Are you out with your truck right now? Are you working? Have you got stuff to, to record and mix? And no, no, no. I'm on the, my summer holiday because of a lot of TV shows was forced to move to autumn. Right. So I'm on holiday. You're on forced holiday. Forced I'm holiday. kind of on holiday. Kind of on holiday as well. That's why I got the first time in my life I've had a, yeah. a tan in the lots, summer. Lots of pre production <laughs> for the autumn. So, so okay, so we're all we're all scrambling around trying to find bits and pieces of work because our main jobs are not available. Is this you know how are we going to get out of this, Mark? Have you got any sense of kind of gigs coming? Or is our industry going to change? Are we going to get more involved in streaming and that kind of stuff? What do you think? I'm hoping that it won't change forever. I hope it's a temporary change in the sense that I, I, I firmly believe that the, it's important to have people gathering to enjoy live music together. It's a social experience. So I hope whatever is going on is temporary. Yeah. Karsten, it's, it's kind of, for me, I've been watching some of these, uh, 
these webinars and it's great it's good kind of like tv but it's not it's not the same right there's something about an audience and a band and all of that it, an orchestra at the same time right there's a there's a feeling of course absolutely and uh yeah, let's see when we can go on with that. But uh, I totally agree with Mark. Uh, we have to. It's it's needed for the community and uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, I hope I will go on tour in February again. Let's see if it will work out. You guys have been relatively unscathed in, in Germany compared to us in Spain. Um, um, so I guess if anybody's going to come out and start doing gigs quickly, it will be, it'll be you, won't it? In Germany, Ooh. certainly. I don't know. Uh, you don't know. Well, none of us know. Listen. I know none of us got a crystal ball. Right? I can't. I can't ask you. I can't ask you to tell me the future. But I, I'm. I'm guessing we have a little sense. Do you have a sense of anything moving forward, Jose Luis? Um, I know there's some productions have started working again in Spain. Yeah, it seems that it's something is moving, but I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Theoretically, I should make a an Starlight concert in Malaga, which is a big audience thing. But I don't know what's going to happen because someday they say it's going to happen. The next day they say they don't know. But I but think I it's going to be I, a very slow movement anyway. I don't think we're allowed more than 100 people or something together at, at, at the moment in Spain. So it's been very know. tricky. Very yeah. tricky. Okay. Um, so I tell you one of the things that interests me uh, very much, and I always ask this of people on these panels, is when a project starts, you know, when, when it before it's before it's happening when it's just in the air when it's not a real thing timo how's, how does a, a production start with you is it a phone call from a production manager a yeah. production company yeah it's normally the production company that calls to me yeah and it's because of the it's either director or musical director that yeah. wants to work with me right and that's how the production company calls and then you work with us and because you have a you have a great reputation for mixing all kinds of music for broadcast in yeah. in, in your area, right? Yeah, so that's we, yeah. What well, what I kind mean, of programs are you mixing? You can you tell me some of the programs that you're mixing? Yeah, I, we are mixing the Voice of Finland, for example, uh, Dancing with the Stars, Talent. Is it Talent? <laughs> talent, and, uh, yeah. Talent, yeah, and. Uh, Ella Many Bees, which is Song of My Life, and Suomi Love. So these, these events, that it, you know, there's it's big bands, there's some playback, there's yeah. different vocalists, lots of channels, yeah, right? Yeah, I mainly do broadcast with um, big bands. Yeah. Not Got speed, it. but shows with the band. And so you have, a, you have relationships with lots of different musical directors and, and, and directors of the TV programs within, within Finland, yeah. and, and that's a direct contact. Well, Finland is a small country that we all know each other. For example, I know Lenny from Voice of Finland about 20 years. Right. And he yeah. always yeah. wants to work with me. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the same in, in, in a lot of our world. Mark, what about you? I mean, you do all kinds of different interesting artists. How, how does a project start? Does it start with a phone call, a conversation, or starts in the studio? How, you know, talk, talk me through a, pro, a typical project or an uh, interesting project. For me, most most of the people I work with are the artists, meaning the, the call comes directly from the artist. And sure. that means it can come from the artist himself or it can come from the artist manager, of course, sometimes the tour manager. Uh, I also, because I do studio and live, there's often the case where I'm working with somebody in the studio and they'll be like, we want to do this live. Will you come with us and do it? Or vice versa, right. the opposite has happened too. I worked with Lou Reed for seven years and I worked with him live for three or four years until we got into the studio first. That's cool. That's a nice jump to make, isn't it? You're, you're doing the shows with him and he's such an iconic artist. And then that must have been a, a great moment when he said, do you want to come and do some work in the studio with us? You must have. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's, all, there's also a really great um, advantage to, to doing both because you really learn how the artist works, what makes them tick, their body language. Another artist I work with, this guy John Zorn, amazing uh, composer. I, you know, I've done a hundred records with him, so I know exactly even how he moves on stage or what he's expecting, what he's about to do, and that. Say that again. You've done a hundred records with him. Over a hundred, yeah. He's very prolific. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's insanely prolific. Yeah, wow. 
Um, Karsten, how, you know, orchestras, that seems to be the, your main body of work. If, if I think of people mixing European artists or worldwide artists in orchestras and, and huge venues, this you I think of, right? So um, Hans Zimmer, for example, you work with. How, how does something like that start? Where does the call come from? The production team? Where, you know, talk us through that. Yeah, it's totally different. Um, so it's sometimes the technical supplier, uh, like it is on the BBC show I'm doing some now since five years, or uh, the promoter, as it was with uh, the world of Hans Zimmer, what I did the last two years. And uh, sometimes it's the conductor, the composer. So it levels out. It's, it's, I cannot say which is more. So it's yeah. always different. Yeah. yeah. And Jose, uh, it seems to be that I live in Spain, you know, the other side from you, but I, I live in Spain. Um, it seems to be whenever there's a kind of high end bit of audio of any description, whether it's studio, live broadcast, you're involved in it. Uh, where does it, is it just all of your experience? You just know so many people that, What's the typical kind of workflow in terms of people getting in touch with you? Well, normally it's the artist, the first one yeah. who contact me, and then it's the manager or producer who contact me. Sometimes I'm a producer, but um, uh, as Mark, sometimes I'm working or recording with some artists, and they are going live, and they say, why don't you come with us? It's a good idea to go there. Or sometimes even they call, they call me for, for a production I don't know anyone, but we saw a, a show that was really nice about, I don't know, an orchestra. Uh, would you like to do this? Thing? Oh, I, I would love it. Okay, see. so I tell you, oh, well, this one, this one interests me. The one where you did with Surratt and the orchestra, was it always going to be an orchestra or did you start to rehearse and decide, I see what we need for this as an orchestra? Or how does well, that process is, happen? The process was, well, uh, with Serrat, I don't do most of the <laughs> orchestra um, thing, but I do a lot of them in life. But the thing yeah. is that I record the album, the, the, the album, the original, the, the first thing he did with the orchestra was a, symp a symphonic album. And then he called me to record it in Barcelona. So we were recording there and then they, they decided to go live. And we were to Palau San Jordi, you know it very well. Yeah, and too. at that point, <laughs> It's a crazy space. Um, they decide um, they they want to to broadcast the thing, and they want me to broadcast the thing. And Fernando Diaz was doing the the PA, so I think it, it was a very good combination. We because we both yeah. know very well each other, and he's a wonderful engineer too. Uh, so we were each one working in his side, taking care yeah. of of the other one. So it was really a wonderful experience. And then these things of Buenos Aires arrived, and we were working there and. It was a huge and wonderful thing. And we were rehearsing always with the orchestra, with the S6L and with all the microphones. We were rehearsing for two days in a different space than the, than the final one. It was going to be first a theater for two days. Uh, it was full, it was very expensive. So they decided to do the same thing outside for free uh, in the street. And it was in, in a very big room. <laughs> I don't know, it was like 30,000, 40,000, I don't know, it was a crazy space, but the, the wow. result was a really wonderful thing. It was really wow, wonderful to work that way. Interesting. That brings me actually to the next point I wanted to bring up, is, is working with the artists. So Karsten, I guess in orchestras, who are you working with? You're working with the, with the conductor, sometimes the composer, I guess. Talk, talk us through that process, please. Um, yes, so... Uh, of course, with everybody. Um, and the main concern of me is uh, to get to create uh, something, what I call always an upward spiral. And there, everybody's in the, involved in that process. What I do, I mean with an upward spiral, it is that um, it start, let's start with a musician. Yeah? They have to feel comfortable on stage. Uh, a musician right. who does not feel comfortable, of course, uh, is will not play at his at 100 percent and so it starts a lot of with monitoring but besides that it's a, more or less it starts with with a new orchestra standing in front of them and saying hello my name is Carsten Kümmel yeah, and this is the sound check and this is how it's going like it's kind of respect and uh, as soon as this trust is created and because why do I have to create that trust it's yeah orchestras they always have in that situation of amplification they have fear 
course yeah. they did. Because they have so many bad experiences of bad live sounds and live concerts where their sound, their energy is not transferred to the audience. And I have to break down that barrier. And uh, so this is first with, good evening, my name is Carsten Kimmel. Yeah? This is a really big part. Okay. And then, so it's about having yeah. a, 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 a presence, right? Being, being able to stand in front of this whole orchestra of people who are basically yes. hardly ever working in a, in a situation where they're amplified. So as yeah. far as they're concerned, this is not a normal day at work. And here's this roadie who we don't normally deal with these people, right? We, the, we do deal with beautiful acoustics and, and holes. And so True. there's somebody who takes care of you. That's uh, the message. Uh, and then the better they play, the better I can make a sound the better the audience enjoys it, the more they cheer and it comes back to the musician. And then we have the upward spiral. That's the main goal. The upward, upward spiral. Is that, is that, I like to think of it as a kind of, it's almost like a commune, right? There's something, when it's working well, it's the audience, it's the engineer, it's the PA system, it's the, it's the orchestra in this case, and everybody's feeling it. Everybody's, everybody's in it together. And uh, actually that's what I miss in most in the, in the doctor. That's what I'm heading for. Yeah. Mark, you work with lots of different in, uh, and interesting artists. Um, what's the trick? You know, do you have a specific approach, or do you deal each with each artist differently, or how, how you know how how do you get the best out of the artist? How do you engender that trust? Uh, it changes a lot from artist to artist, but like I said earlier, there, I I tend to have a personal relationship with the people I work with, and so. In most cases, that trust has already been established, unless, yeah. of course, it's you know the first gig with somebody. Uh, so I usually talk to them. I agree with Karsten. It's about making people comfortable, making them feel like they're taken care of, and they can stay on stage and not have to worry about anything. They know that underneath the stage, somebody's taking care of business. And that's um, actually one of the things that I, th that in, in my career, I find is really helped with that is being a virtual sun check, right? Now. In the, back in the day, people only used to, could could only ever hear the sound that you did third hand through, I don't know, their manager says the sound was like this, or their girlfriend says that the sound was like that. But now with the virtual sound check, we can actually just, they can sit with us. He or she, the artist can sit there and, and, and just, uh, and, and, and critique what we do, and, and, and then, but they have a really clear picture of, of, of what we're doing, right? Does that help? Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah, virtual sound check has been a huge asset, especially when you're on the touring circuit and you, you don't have the full day or it's a festival, things like that. Uh, so I've used it more for uh, making sure that everything is set up before the artist even gets there, than more so than to uh, listen to the mix with the artist. But I've, both has happened for sure. Right. Uh, Jose Luis, you were telling me a story about that, right, with the orchestra? And uh, obviously, you, yeah. did, you know, you yeah, go it's a ahead. Good thing because the, yeah, the, the good thing was that um, uh, using the virtual sound check, the orchestra could listen to what they did the day before in the theater, and they were not, um, I, they they don't like at the very beginning to have a, such, such a close microphone uh, in his in, in the instrument. So uh, when they were able to hear the orchestra to, to play the previous recording. Uh, out there, they said, oh, what, what, what is that, the CD, the symphonic CD? No, no, it's, it's you yesterday playing. Oh, sure, yeah. And it, and from that point, it was perfect. I mean, so you had, you had you your trust. Yeah, yeah. And how, they, <laughs> did they want it loud? Did they want it louder than it would naturally be? What was, what was... It, it was louder than natural, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> but not crazy. I mean, I don't like to work crazy in terms of levels any, any time. Doesn't matter if it's an orchestra or whatever. But I think the good thing of amplification is that you can do something natural, but it's, but uh, that can hit you in some way, you know. And that's as Carson say, it makes the, to feel something new, and yeah. it's what I think that we have to do, and that's why we are there. Nice, Timo. Singing with the stars, or you know, you know, voice of Finland or whatever. Do you work with the artist? Do they, do they expect that they're going to sound like, you know, Maria Carey after the first recording? How does that work? Well, uh, mainly the musical director is the guy yeah. who says what to do. But um, of course, I know everybody in the band and uh, 
but the musical director is the one who's my best friend. Yeah. And who I'm supposed to please. That's right. So are are they are they allowed in? Are the artists allowed in the truck? Are they, do you let them in your truck? Uh, the house band normally is not allowed to come to the truck. <laughs> uh, only the musical director, and if there is a supporting act or whatever it is called, and he or she wants to come to listen to the recording, he or she comes with the musical director. Right. The musical director has always the last word. Right. Because, yeah, that, that makes sense, right? Because that's the responsibility is going to stop there yeah. with the musical director. So, so um, actually, before we get into like mainstream orchestras, I, I want to talk about some like experimental music. Like, um, actually, I'm going to go to you, Mark, because uh, Zorn, he's a, he has all kinds of stuff going on, right? Some crazy, tell, me, tell us some of the crazy setups that he's had on the stage. Two yeah, different bands well, and stuff. Uh, what we've been doing lately in the last five or six years is uh, he brings uh, 27 to 30 musicians on stage and groups them into 12 to 14 bands. So every concert lasts four hours and is comprised of 13 or 14 bands with super quick changeovers. Wow. Um, and so it's the challenge is, of course, uh, you know, making everything seem flawless and seamless. Uh, the way I do that with, with Zorn, with that particular setup, is I only do work with two snapshots, one for the acoustic bands and one for the electric bands. And then I do the rest of the mixing with faders and my hands. Yeah, I've seen videos of you mixing and you're very dynamic, you're moving, you know, you're, you're properly mixing. Um, I pr yeah, I, I mean, maybe that comes from the studio world. I don't know, but I, 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 I think it's very important to bring dynamics back into mixing, especially because we make so much and such heavy use of compressors live to keep things in check uh, yeah. that it ends up if you don't move if you don't move your faders, it ends up being sounding pretty flat. Everything is in control, of course, but mm. you lose that excitement that dynamics can give you. And so I try to bring it back. Yeah, Carson, over to you. I know yeah. you're a huge fan of the dynamics. Talk us through some of the, some of the moves that you make on your orchestral concerts. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, I totally agree. And uh, I just wanted to mention, we're in the live business, more or less, we are the people who can use the whole range of dynamic of the orchestra. Uh, and uh, it's, how do you get, especially, of course, I'm not talking about techno or heavy metal, uh, but how can you get people inside the music and really be con uh, concentrated and create some magic? And this is when you make it silent, quiet. Yeah? And when you can hear a needle falling in an arena. And these are the magic moments. And I, thank you, Mark. I totally agree with you. Dynamics is yeah. a very good thing. So, uh, yeah, it's the difference between live and recorded music, isn't it? Sometimes, I, you know, I'm driving along in my car with some classical music on, and I think, oh, the, the music stopped. It's not. It's just the dynamic reach is such that it's just disappeared into the engine noise. And, but, but you can do that live, right? You can get away with that live. And, in fact, I think you even sometimes you told me you, ex you exaggerate the, the kind of the peaks as well. Absolutely, I do. So my, my record is, it was on the, the world of Hans Timmer. We had... Uh, Hannibal, it was my record was down that we had 20, 42 uh, dB SPL. So, and the lowest point was always the AC in the venue. And, uh, but then in the next song, Lion King, we had peaks at 115. And so I exaggerated the dynamic range of an orchestra via 15 dBs. And this creates the magic, the power, and the emotions. And that's our job. Yeah, that's the excitement. That's the excitement, Jose, isn't it? And the dynamics, that's where, the, that's where the, the, the spine tingles. Yeah, I, I think it's the big difference between live and recording things. When you are recording, you, you have to take care. And of course, you can work with dynamics, but you can go with a solo like very loud because it will be crazy in the record. But live, you can do that. And it's really wonderful when you do that with a guitar player or as a violin player. It doesn't matter what you do. It's every always is exciting and everybody lo lo loves that, that kind of thing yeah 
So, so are you bouncing off that mark? Are you bouncing off the audience? Are you, are you, are you, are you working with the response of the audience when when you're working on your dynamics? Of course. I mean, the audience is my true meter, so to yeah. speak. You know. Yeah. But it's a much nicer meter than the view meter. Because we, you know, it's, it's one of the tricks of being a sound engineer, is is understanding the way that the audio interacts with the with the audience, right? I've I was I've spoken about this in, in the past. So sometimes when something is quiet and the audience are a little bit noisy, the temptation is to kind of push push it up. But actually, the the, the best thing to do is is pull it back and make the audience realize that they need to be quiet. Particularly in North America, I find when if there's a quiet moment in a, in, in, a, in a piece of music, uh, people feel they need to whoop a lot. There's a, there's a lot of whooping and quiet points in the music. And, uh, you know, you, you're never going to get louder than the whoops, but so you need to just adjust around it, right? Yeah, it, it also depends on, you know, what kind of music you're mixing, because oftentimes the people that go to classical music are a little bit more behaved than the, your average rock audience. And so, you know... <laughs> You deal with that's who, who your audience is at any given point. That's 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 a fair enough point. But I would say that I once did an orchestra in, in a stately home in the UK with about ten thousand people all having a picnic, listening to you know Four Seasons or whatever. And I was kind of amplifying the orchestra, not nearly as well as you guys do, just very badly. Um, and there was this constant sound of pop, 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 pop in the audience, and that was people popping their champagne bottles with their uh, with their picnics. Oh yeah, so, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually. <laughs> You know, the artist you mentioned earlier, Zorn, he won't play in a place that serves food because he doesn't want to hear, you know, cutlery and things like that. Yeah. He, he wants people to focus on the music. And I think that's only that's only fair. If you're going yeah. to the concert, you know, be be in it, be with it. Be there. Stop. Uh, that's the other thing. Stop looking at it through your phone. That's the thing. I, I never understand. I'm going to record it on my phone and not look at it and I'll watch it when I get home. I've never understood that. Um, yeah, and I don't think does. anyone really does watch it when they get home. <laughs> that they don't, do they? Well, they put a little bit on Facebook or something, I don't know. So, Timo, you don't, it's a different dynamic for you, right? Because you're working with loudness. You're working in the broadcast world. You're working with loudness. You're working with, we, Chris and I just did a, a, a webinar about loudness. So you're working with the old luffs and all of that. What, what, are you, what kind of standards are you working to? Yeah, we are forced to use EBU rules. So it's minus 23 yeah. LUFS. Plus minus one LU. Got you. And if we don't mix that, the <clears throat> some commercial channels they have some automatic mixers that force to mix that. So yeah. it's quite terrible here the result if you don't mix. If you don't, if you don't hit your targets, yeah. somewhere down the road there's somewhere, going to be some automation that's going to smash it to pieces. Yeah. That, that's quite terrible. And different, different, like for, different formats have different standards, right? So, you know, um, Netflix or, or or whatever, YouTube has have different different loudness levels, don't they? Yeah, YouTube is minus fourteen, LUFS, yeah. but our truck is um, calibrated to minus twenty three, and if it's forced to mix the YouTube or face book or, or, or whatsoever it is uh, volume upgraded somewhere else yeah i hear you and, so, and of course i mix all the time yeah and the thing yeah. of course is you have to reduce your dynamic range as well for broadcast right yeah. the range is between five to ten LUs. exactly so that that wouldn't work for karsten that wouldn't work for you karsten would it on in a live concert for sure. No, we uh, didn't. <laughs> and uh, Jose Luis, you, you do all of this. You do broadcast and you do live. Do you ever, do you ever stream at, at the same time as you do live or, or is it one or the other? Well, no, normally I, or I stream or I do a mix for streaming or I do a mix for live. But I just once, I think in France, I have to do of things at the same time, but it was it was a very easy thing. It was a piano and a vocal concert from, with Luz Casal. So they des decided that the sound from the the PA was very good. So they decided to stream that thing instead of using the the track. Um, but normally, they, I think they are really different jobs. You can do a mix for for broadcast 
um, and life at the same time because you you lose a lot of, of dynamics. Yeah. Uh, in, I mean, you have to take care of that, and you can go with a solo like that or. Uh, I've got a feeling, it's, it's just me, and I've got a feeling that when we come back from this, because the artists have got involved in streaming, they've liked being on the social media, streaming from their kitchen, playing the acoustic guitar or whatever. I've got a feeling that as artists, the artists are going to be asking us, well, you know, we're going to do this, but it's an extra stream of income. We're going to do it live on, on Facebook Live or whatever. Um, and we don't want to bring in a truck because that's expensive because, you know, we have only can sell 50% of the seats, so you're going to have to do it from your desk. I've got, I've got this sneaky feeling, I might be wrong, that we're going to be sitting there mixing the show and doing a matrix mix off to, you know, Facebook Live or whatever at minus 16 LKFS with a condensed dynamic range, and that's just going to be added, added to the list of things that we do. It any, can be any done, thoughts? I think. Hmm? Yeah, I think it can be done even using a... a and actually our tracks are stereo different um, where you can work in pre or post depending on what you are working with and I think it can be done too but I think it's, it could be crazy to, to pretend to have exactly the, they are different qualities under my point of view. Right so here's here's one I wanted to talk about I'm going to start with you Mark on this one the over overall arch of a show right it's something that I'm very interested in it's something I'm very conscious of it's as you as you build a show, you know, you, you don't want to peak too early, right? You don't want it to be just loud from the get go and stay loud. You need to it needs to have a curve, right, to to, to engage people in that. Is that something that you work with? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, depending on artists, Zorn is very much into the overall overall arch of the show. So we have conversations about that. He uh, uh, programs the evening with that in mind, and yeah. I quote unquote amplify that that his, his vision in that sense uh so he likes zorn likes contrast so there will very often be like a metal band after a string quartet for example <laughs> uh he thrives on on contrast and i think it's great but overall i try to think of the whole thing as as a as something that has to continue building until the very end absolutely uh, it's, it's not it's not just a bunch of random pieces of music stuck together. It's it's a it's an overall arch to the dynamics. Karsten, you must be you must be conscious of that all of the time, right? Ah, uh, um, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> because okay. most we have such a uh, dynamic range in most of my concerts. Uh, nearly yeah. ninety-five percent of my work is with orchestras, and uh, more or less it comes with the music. Um, so. Other very talented people thought of that before, and uh, so of course it's <laughs> it's for sure that a Lion King comes at after two thirds of the concert, yeah, and then it ends with uh, something like Pirates of the Caribbean or something. Sure. And, uh, yeah. So more or less in most cases, it really comes with the music, and if not, then uh, yeah, there it happens that me and the conductor and as well other people. And we are talking about that and trying to improve. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, um, um, as have we have we got some questions from the from the audience? Um, um, yeah, we can uh, we can actually do a couple. Uh, actually, the very first one, uh, quick one for a uh, quick round, maybe quick one for Jose Luis. Uh, did you live used to live in uh, Toronto in the nineties? One panel member was asking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, that, must be, that must be. I've been there. I've been there working, and I, I, I did a few concerts there, but I, I didn't live there at all. <laughs> right. Okay. So now that we get that out of the way, get okay. uh, to some of the you more Facebook uh, or something like that. Personal message. <laughs> <laughs> um, specific question uh, for Carson. When you were explaining uh, about talking to going in front of the orchestra, uh, do you actually talk to the individual members of the orchestra, or are you communicating through someone like the conductor, or is how, how far does that personal contact go? I guess um, it goes very deep, and um, because it's really important, and it is important to show the orchestra that you are not only working with the conductor. Uh, it is important that you work with your single musicians as well. Um, there are some rules when you, uh, when you work with an orchestra. For example, when the orchestra enters uh, the stage, there is the first violinist player who is called the concert master. 
and his substitute. And uh, every time, every day, you have to shake hands with these both. That's, that's a rule inside the orchestra. And as well, a small rule is um, when you have your speech to the orchestra, I never go on the podium of the, uh, the conductor because that's his place, not mine. Uh, so I stand next to it. And uh, there's another thing uh, which is really important for me. I always check the positioning of my microphones prior to the sound check, immediately prior to the sound check, when all the musicians are on stage, are on their chairs. And th then I walk through the orchestra and I say, hey, hello, how are you doing? Well, how was your uh, ride? And uh, just say small th uh, things to the people. And this is good. And as well, like standing in the catering, don't pass by the row, st stay in the row with the musicians and everything. Having some party with them when on the off days. Yeah. yeah. So I, I try to have very uh, a lot of conversation with the uh, musicians. Yeah. It's very important. Cool. Thank you. Um, Rob, I, I think uh, there's, there's a bunch more other questions, but I think uh, I, I know, of course, the topic list of what's to come. Well, so, actually, uh, so, I, so Karsten just I mentioned, touched on microphones, and that's exactly where I want to go next. So, um, Mike in an orchestra, right? It's not something I've done very much about, so I was very curious to, to, to speak to, to the experts on this. Um, I'm going to, you know, okay, I'm going to start with you, Karsten. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's a kind of decca tree, spot mic in, individual mic in. Talk us through through the way you can do it. And maybe Chris, you can share this. You can share a, a diagram of, of some of Karsten's work. Mm -hmm. So Karsten, yeah. talk us. Um, first of all, it depends uh, the microphone philosophy. If I if I'm working in operas or pure classical music, so Mozart, Beethoven, Dvorak, whatever. And or if I'm working for crossovers like film music, musical, so and this is a, a difference in setting up the microphones. Right here, we see a picture of uh, my last year's concert with the Royal Philharmonics uh, and Anne Sophie Mutter. Uh, we had uh, she was playing Across the Stars, it was called music from John Williams. He uh, arranged especially for her. She's and an absolute superstar, right. She is, she is, a, a, never heard such a, a, she's an incredible violin player. Yeah. And of course, it comes along with the Stradivari. And so a, a couple of millions worth uh, uh, violin. And in that case, uh, John Williams, he likes it very, uh, the classical way. So more or less like Beethoven. And uh, so I do a lot of overheads, only overheads. I have no single... Uh, clip microphones at the uh, instruments. You can see that um, in front of the stage. It's like a, like it looks like a decca tree in front of the stage there, right? There is a decca tree and uh, it's all omnidirectionals. Uh, I use omnidirectionals. We, we don't, it's a little bit uh, different than in a recording uh, because I don't have a good sounding place here. Uh, all these shoebox the stages, yeah. uh, they don't sound good. But why do I use the omnidirectionals? Because they have the better low end. And okay. uh, I use them to clue all the single spot microphones together. And uh, so in a recording, I would start with the main microphone system, so with a Decker, A, B, X, Y, whatever. And uh, then I would feed the, the spot microphones to the level which is needed, still needed. And here it's a, the other way around. I start with my spot microphones, which are pretty high as well. So one and a half meters away from a violin, for example. Yeah, and I then see that. I add the main microphone system until I have whole string sections, not single violin players. That's that what I want to reach with that. And and the micro it looks like is it one microphone bef between four players or something there and and the, the violin? That's what I'm usually doing. Yeah, uh, on that case it was a little bit different because we had uh, television there as well and we had to hide some microphones. That's why they are so low. And the, what we see here is uh, the first violins. So yeah. there is in that case there is one microphone for two players. Okay. And uh, but usually I use one for four players. Uh, and uh, have it pointed uh, above the first row, 
pointing yeah. towards the second row and uh, it's the double distance but uh, on a car read microphone has minus 6 dB at the sound which is coming from 90 degrees and so I get four players with the same loudness in one microphone and that results in a much better blending slightly and different tonal right. quality as well though off, off axis though right um not with the good microphones okay so okay yeah. great so but, tell us what microphones they are then tell us what microphones you're using on this um the there are plenty of very good microphones of course they are used uh, like the Sheps or neumann of course the sennheisers but as well uh, what i really like is uh, se electronics uh, and i what i do with all the microphones i test them and um, not how are they are in the zero degrees direction because that every manufacturer can handle that one the good divides from the bad ones when you look at the lateral sound yeah. and there is hardly a single microphone pointing with a zero degrees at an instrument in my productions yeah. so lateral sound it's very very important for me so chris could you pull up the 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 diagram of the the orchestra that carson was working with the bbc one mm -hmm. Um, so we can, it might be easier if, if you kind of talk to that diagram as well, we can get a sense of that. So t talk us through how you would mic up this, 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 this group of musicians. This is a BBC Planet 2 live in concert, right? Yeah, this is uh, uh, the BBC tour. And um, what I did there is uh, with the normal overhead microphones, the spot microphones, I had uh, two per group in the string. So two for the first violins, two microphones for the second, two for the violas, two for the cello, and two for the basses. And uh, that doesn't seem too much, but no. the main goal is as well to glue it together. And as well, um, they are sufficient. When I have very quiet and uh, calm songs, they are absolutely sufficient because they I have a huge distance right. to the to the sound sources. And as well, when we go to the woodwinds, uh, we have here two one. Uh, what is it? Two one two one, which means two flutes, one oboe, two clarinets, uh, one bassoon. And I use one microphone for the flutes, placing it between them. Same again, if I place two with a certain distance to both instruments, then I would uh, that would result in a comb filter. And I try to avoid that everywhere, where is it possible? And uh, the choir as well, only one per, uh, per four singers. And uh, what I like is the distance. And as well, when you look at all these small diagram, uh, small uh, membrane microphones, they are all calibrated for one meter. Yeah. And that is one meter, one and a half. That's where I'm usually working at. That's what I what I try to achieve. Um, and do you use any delay for this? Do you do you use any delay to? Um, you know, if, if I'm yeah. sat in the front row of the of of a, of a concert hall, um, yeah. I'm going to hear the first violins way before I hear the flute acoustically, right? Because it's true. Um, yes, I do. Um, I have some special things in my PA setup. I can say, tell a little later when we come to that. Um, it is. I use two kinds of delay. Uh, in that concert uh, on the planet Earth, we have something very special, and that is the PA is nine meters upstage. So I don't have to use a delay on that because the PA is later anyway. Yeah. And uh, But normally I do. I want to have the first sound, the first wall of sound from the orchestra. And so I have to delay the PA system. That's one uh, what I do, and as well in classical music as soon as we uh, we don't have a band within i delay the microphones inside the orchestra to a virtual zero point and the virtual zero point is the place where i would sit to and i would like to listen to the orchestra in an unamplified concert okay. and I try to replicate the timing what this listener perceives so you would measure from that point in 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 the hall to the first violin to the, the percussion or whatever and then, then use delay use delay from that point from that your zero yes, point true every single microphone yeah, so okay microphone. Like nine meters you got your pa nine meters up stage yeah you've got very sparse microphones a meter and a half from the sources um i would have thought you know volume before feedback would be quite small on that that would that would frighten me 
<laughs> but I'm, of course, you know, I'm a rock and roll guy. Yeah, it, it, maybe it wouldn't work with a with a show where you have to push the silent songs to 95 or 100. Um, it's not the case in that shows. Yeah, yeah. It, it, of course, the orchestra shows. I mean, I didn't normally can say I'm an average at about between 85 and 89. Uh, so so you, half an hour average. Would you yeah. think of it as sound reinforcement then rather than, than pure amplification? Here it is. Well, uh, uh, maybe I got lost in translation. Yeah, um, but it, yeah. it is uh, yeah, tra transferring uh, that. Uh, trans I tra always say it's transporting emotions. But yeah. uh, in that case, of course, it, uh, we had been concerned about that, especially with the nine meters when we came up with that nine, uh, five years ago. But it works. And uh, what I needed to do for that is to have a long PA system, eight meters, uh, to get a directivity at 50 hertz. Um, eight as, meter. Yeah. So how many boxes is that? I say, I don't know what you use <laughs> when you use an L acoustics or something. That's a lot of boxes. Yeah, it is. When I'm using L acoustics, and then most of the time I'm on the road with a, a hang. Uh, it's out of 12k1 and 8k2. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds That's, funny when you only have, you have to achieve 87 dB in the average. Yeah, yeah, I have a little bit more than that on Radiohead, but I'm slightly yeah. different kind of. Yeah. volume involved in that um it seems like a lot of but you need that box for the coverage right you need those boxes for the coverage not for the volume those boxes sound for the great directivity. Whatever level. yeah for the directivity i need it and you're just using left right you're not going to you're not doing any kind of immersive or you got a c do you have an lcr or are you just lr uh no it's an lr and um for the center, I try on a tour to make something special. Uh, it's something what I call a spectral uh, delta stereophonic system in the near fields. And uh, so which I divide the whole orchestra in 24 boxes. And each box has a subgroup and these subgroups go with different timings, different equalization on the single near field speakers and uh, to give a localization in that place. Oh, yeah. And uh, because it's, you know, the front rows are always the most expensive seats and there you, there you have the VIPs and they are normally listening to mono. It's not so nice. <laughs> well, yeah, I, but they'll also be here in this case, they'll be hearing a lot of the orchestra acoustically, I'm guessing as well. Yeah, true, yeah, true. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Hey, I'm going to move over to you, Jose Luis, because I think you have a slightly different w method of doing this. Can you pull up Jose Luis's diagram, please, Chris? You still out there, Jose Luis? No, he's not. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you'd left. I thought you'd gone. Okay, here's your diagram. This is, what is this one then? Okay, the thing is, this is, well, it's a very different approach because uh, in this case, the PA was behind the musician. So yeah. it was a um, film premiere uh, where they decided to make um, a special mix, mix without uh, the, the music. So the players were playing the music in real time um, so let me that. just clarify so we got a live orchestra at the, the movie premiere and you're playing the orchestral score that's involved in the movie and you're amplifying yeah. it to, to, to blend in with the, with the audio that's coming off the movie yeah that's right we didn't use the um, cinema amplification at all except for this round which is it was very helpful but the left and the right were, was for the film for effects and for the dialogue. And we have a special PA left and right and, um, that mm, was used for the orchestra, only for the orchestra. The thing is that because all the orchestra was, mm, um, the, the, I mean, the PA was behind the orchestra, we need yeah. to do, use really very close mic microphone Close mic in. Each musician has his own mic. As you so each see, one of these, the, the blue dots and the green dots represent microphones, right? So these are all, I'm guessing, some kind of Lavalier microphone on each of each of those. Talk us well, about no, microphones. They, they, yeah, they, they are uh, the, blue, the blue ones are the stage one, the green one are the stage two because they were like 86 yeah. input or something like that at, at the very end. And yeah. um, what we get there, the, we were using mainly forty ninety nine for the strings. DPAs. Yeah, DPAs. that's right. Bass yeah. also for for um, uh, boot wings. Uh, yeah. For singers, we use fifty eights, and for um, um, brass, uh, we use dynamic ones for for uh, 
for two ones because they really work very well. And for percussion, I use also some Omnis DPAs. So, and the DPAs, were you clipping them onto, were you clipping them onto their violins or were you, where yeah, were they? In, in each instrument, as Karsten said, said you, you have to talk with the, first with the conductor and yeah. tell him, please explain him what we are doing and why, why we need these microphones in there. Uh, usually the very young musicians have no problem with that because they usually to, used to do this kind of stuff with his fans or whatever. Yeah. The old musicians um, used to take care about the, the instruments and what are you going to do with my instrument at this microphone? Yeah. But very scared that end, you're going to damage their instrument. Yeah. Scratch. You don't but want to scratch the, a 400 year old cello, do you? Yeah, that's right. And I, I think they also scared about, oh, they are really listening to me perfectly and, or maybe too loud. And uh, <laughs> it's normal to hear someone touching the microphone to, to, to see if it's working. It's <laughs> uh, oh, it's, um, yeah, that's right. At the end, you, you can, you, you are hearing the whole mix and you don't have any problem at all. And the thing also, I, I uh, have to work with really louder levels than custom because in cinema, usually the music is really loud. That's yeah. why you use so close mic in there. And I think that there is a photo that, that you have where you can see the um, uh, how, how the orchestra was arranged. I think uh, Chris is going to throw that photograph up right now. Yeah, I, I, was, I was talking, it's quite interesting for me that micing up the, micing up the violins. I did a, a concert in, in, with Massive Attack a couple of years ago in, in, a, in a huge park with a, mm -hmm. in, in Hyde Park in London. And we had 24 piece string section. And for the sound check, the, the, they, they wouldn't get their instruments out of the cases because it was a bit damp and they were worried about the dampness getting into the violins and cellos. So we didn't have a sound check, which was, yeah, because people the, are very protective of, of, and they should be of, of, you know, important instruments. That's right. Okay, talk us through this. This is, yeah, so you, you can see that they, they have to remove a uh, few chairs, a, well, a lot of chairs to put the whole orchestra in there. And, so you can see the control at the uh, mm, the control we have the two pro tool systems for the mm, basically for images for the conductor yeah. and for video i mean and uh, you can see the all those the microphones over there and at the end all the mic the the musicians take a lot of care of the microphones and they they will really respect everything and because we have uh, we we will be using we will be using LPC. I mean, thank God for automation. So right. when we have a queue where we have no woodwinds or we have no chili, for example, they will yeah. mute. Um, so let me just, just let me just make sure that everybody at home understands that. So you were using LTC, so linear time code, which be, I guess was being generated by the movie, and you were you were using you were triggering your snapshots on the S6L from the LTC and. I, I, I guess you were yeah, mainly that's using that's that for kind of mute and fader position. Were you, were you doing anything more than that with those? Well, I did a lot of things with the snapshot mutes and some effects changing and uh -huh. some, yeah, pre-record positions of um, uh, sections. Um, well, I don't know if it does, doesn't have any sense if I explain you how I arrange the thing in the mix or, um, I mean, what I'm using is having strings in one stem, with wings in another, and a different one, brass yeah. in a different one, and piano, harp in a different one, and percussion in another one. Actually, we, 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 got, we got a couple of slides of that. Chris, check that out. So this, I found this fascinating. So, so I still lose the semi show file. He sent me a picture of all of his inputs, right? And all of your inputs look like this. Yeah, flat, well, completely flat EQ, with just a high pass filter. Uh, you, yeah. sh you sent me 86 of these, which was, <laughs> which, which is great. <laughs> but well, the, but then you send each section to a group, right? And you EQ from the group. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because, well, uh, the high pass filter depends on the range of the instrument. Of course, if you have a double bass, the uh, frequency will be really low. Uh, but if you have a first violin or a violin or a viola, the, the frequencies will be higher. And if you have a piccolo, it will be even higher. Because it doesn't have any sense. Right, to... and then sh Chris shows, shows, the, shows an output. Shows an output. Um, uh, um, finally, I send everything to a group. To I have VCAs for it's for violins, VCAs for second violins, VCA for mm, viola, VCA for celli, VCAs for double basses. But yeah. the whole the whole strings goes into finally into a group, 
Um, these uh, cues are related to feedback in this case because uh, the fee was behind, the so system, you have to yeah. take a lot of care with that. Um, I usually have a pull tech EQ also for the group, um, more to give that kind of sound I want to from the top and uh, in the um, from the bottom. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so that's kind of cool. So you, 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 pretty much all of the all the microphones they're individually microphoned. Uh, mm. The mics are flat. You're sending them to a group and you're kind of EQing them, you're processing them as, yeah, as a right. group. Yeah. Well, in some Are cases, you... I, I don't send you the 86 channels, I think, but I send you a lot of them. <laughs> but in some <laughs> cases, like the piano or harp, they have a very special conversation. It depends yeah. on the... Oh, harp is a crazy instrument to amplify in a good yeah. way. And usually the orchestra is not that loud, and but in the films they are really loud and they want to have it there, so you have to work with both uh, um, because piano and harp were in the, in the same group. I have a very um, different cues in that case, not only high pass filter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. F absolutely, absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, let's go, let's have a little chat with Mark about yes. this stuff. So, hey, Mark, you still there? I'm still here. How you doing, bud? Right, okay. So let's have a look at one of a typical setup of Mark. We got a drawing of, of that as well, Chris, I believe. Thanks yeah, everybody this, for sending me this stuff. Talk us through this one, Mark. Uh, this is a band of uh, Mike Patton, who's the singer of Fate No More, who has this project called Mondo Cane, which is basically, as you can see, band plus orchestra. The orchestra uh, changes in size. Uh, most times it's uh, 12 strings. Sometimes it's bigger. Um, most of the productions that I do have the peculiarity of being a loud live band with strings. So for me, the name of the game is uh, to reduce uh, feedback uh, or leakage, I should say, into the strings. So I use all spot mics. Um, I use a, a combination of DPAs, 4099s, uh, and Remic v, v5200. Uh, Remic is a Danish company as well, like like DPA. Uh, it's a it's a much newer, more recent company. They're less than five years old. And in fact, what's uh, what's interesting, what Carson said earlier about talking to the orchestra, I do that with them as well because most of them have never seen one of these Remics. Right. Uh, we got a picture of that, I think, Chris. Right, check that out, Jimmy. Yeah, that's what it looks like before it's connected to a stage box. It's basically a little thing the size of a quarter that goes between the wood and the fingerboard. And it's got, got a picture of that as well. Yeah. It's got two mics inside. On the picture on the right, you see a little hole. That's one mic pointed at the bridge. The other mic is pointed at the wood. And the two signals are blended into one. You get them out of one. Uh, it's, a, it's a mic that doesn't sound as... A, real and as pretty as a 4099 but you can push it much much further than you can before feedback than a 4099 so usually in my orchestra setups i have a combination of the two mics uh if they're soloists i give them 4099s and all the others get these uh remic microphones and then I have a similar approach to the one of Jose Luis in the sense that I have two EQs, one for the 4099 and one mm -hmm. for the for the remic. And then all the strings together with their two sets of EQs go to a group with a GEQ, graphic EQ, where I, uh, I uh, EQ the overall uh, sound of this string section. And what I also do after that is I usually have a low pass filter and sometimes I ride the fader of the group of the string section. Sometimes yeah. I actually ride the low pass filter to just open them up if they have to speak louder in a section. Oh, interesting. So you, that, you use that to make them kind of darker or brighter depending on, on, on whether they're, you want them in front of the mix or, or, or blending. Yes, yes and no. But really what I'm doing is I'm trying to get uh, cymbals and loud guitars out of them until you need to really hear them. Yeah. Like yeah, so, if they're just playing pads, you know, then you can be a l you can go a little lower with that low pass filter. But then, if they're playing solos or if there's a section where they're featured, featured, then you you just open it up. And do you, do you use any any sound protection? Do you use any baffling between the the rock band and the 
the new yes. orchestra? Yes, you, you, in, the, in the picture before, if Chris wants to go back, you saw that there's a plexiglass screen, ah, yeah, you're right. usually at least four panels. To uh, I, I, When I started this gig 10 years ago with Mike Patton, I, I tried to put it in f around the drummer and the percussionist. Yeah. Uh, but the truth is those guitars you see right next to the strings were blaringly loud. The string section was unhappy because they're classical musicians and then they don't like to hear, you know, loud guitars. And the drummer was unhappy too. Drummers, you know, notoriously hate plexiglass. Yeah, so eventually yeah. we started advancing uh, multiple plexiglass panels so that we can encapsulate uh, the whole string section. And yeah, that way really everyone is to... happy. I'd be really tempted to try and get the guitarist to use, you know, the old virtual guitar amps, you know, the simulators or something like that. No, so those are yeah. like real old fashioned, like with 12 inch speakers blaring at the violin. Yeah, those are two twins you see back there, so they're <laughs> loud. <laughs> <laughs> and is that wedges? You got wedges on the floor and all of this? We got everything is wedges. This band use, uses no in-ears, um, you know, it's just their reference. The singer is, you know, Mike Patton, for those who don't know him, is, is basically a, a rock star that's, yeah. that comes from the time of Wedges. So he's definitely not going on in years. Uh, I'm sure some of the other band members might be open for it, but it's just never come up. It's always been like this. And what about something like Zorn? We don't have a drawing of, of, of your setup with Zorn, but that's is that a similar kind of thing? Because he makes his he makes his jazz bands and rock bands and classical music all at the same time, right? Yes, everything everything is in wedges, no in ears on that either. Uh, and what we do with Zorn is we have a fixed back line in the back, uh, drums, keys, bass, guitars, all of that is fixed. Usually two drummers, two drum sets, and yeah. then everything that happens downstage of that back line uh, is moved in those very quick stage stage changes wow we, r rolling risers i guess and rolling things on and off no no it's it's all small stuff it's all like right. you know a mic and a music stand for a saxophone and a trumpet okay. or for Fair, yeah. a string so it's it's it as long as you have good crew you get it done you know in under a minute kind of like formula one tire ch changing swapping right <laughs> yeah man thanks for that um Timo, how are you? Are you still still there? You, you've been sitting quietly while we've been talking about Mike and orchestras. Um, I'm guessing uh, in the broadcast world, one of the biggest things is, is Mike and the audience as well as the, as the band, right? That's, that's yeah. good for you. I want to make the audience feel like they are in the hall. Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the <coughs> audience right there. So the and audience miking is very important to me. And what do you do? Do you have like a, a five microphone thing above the audience or do you spot mic around the, the building or how, how, what do you generally do? Well, it's, it depends on the show, but it's about eight to, let's say, 16 audience mics. Got yeah. And uh, the trick is that the OB truck normally delays the uh, picture about 40 or 80 milliseconds. So mm -hmm. I put the band in that 80 millisecond delay and then I can adjust the audience mics with that that amount of delay that's a huge yeah. amount of delay yeah, yeah. so, so that's are, that yeah then we are in sync all the time go yeah and then uh, you work in a 5-1 is that right do you work uh, in 5-1 sometimes no, or are you normally mainly stereo mainly so, stereo yeah because in Finland I think 99% people watch the TV shows in stereo and 1% they have um, the 5.1 system tuned incorrect way. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so what about microphone? We're, we've been talking about microphones. What, um, have you got any special microphones? you use any special microphone trickings that you use for, for, for well, drum well, kits or vocals? Mm -hmm. or? In our shows, the music varies to cha from jazz to heavy metal. So we are mainly a close up miking. Yeah. So it's the like strings are for the 99 DPAs and uh, choir, each individuals are 58. 
So how yeah. many how many people in the choir? Uh, Twenty to thirty. Twenty to thirty, and you mic you mic each one of them individually with a, with an SM58. Yeah, and I have to EQ every each one, the own way. So I EQ inputs all the time. Also wow. strings, because every string sounds different. So I yeah. EQ inputs, and yeah. then put some multi compressor to outputs. Go yeah. Uh, so you, but I like very much the ribbon microphones. I ribbon really microphones, like, yeah. yeah. I use a lot of like Royers and Brass and Finnish handmade microphones, Sandhill and Crumb. Sandhill, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, this, uh, these kind of microphones, the Sandhills, I can use those like in jazz music that the uh, whole drum kit is from the overheads. And then Good. move with the close up microphones like Earthworks on toms and 57 uh, snare and move it to metal music okay and more so for can, by, by use, using yeah, the, yeah, the close yeah i have to variate the different kind of music styles of course because in the same tv show you can have and one TV, one yeah. of the contestants sings a jazz song and one somebody does a heavy metal so but it's a house band so you have to be able to adjust the house band on the fly right yeah very cool. Very cool. Um, okay, let's. I want to talk a little bit about you know laying out. Actually, no. Didn't you say you had a a, a, a choir of three thousand, Karsten? So yeah. I made them put three thousand fifty eights out. Did you? It was actually it was it was uh, bigger. Uh, the was biggest bigger show we had was four thousand two hundred singers and. Uh, yeah, of course. There's always the question: How to mic uh, such a big choir? Uh, um, 4,258, that would be the way I would do it. Uh, 4,258 <laughs> and 4,199 uh, Y cables, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a, it's a, a production. I worked with a, a German composer, Dieter Falk, together since more than since 10 years. And he's now doing a third production. We should have had a concert in December with the next production, but mm, of course. Um, and the first question is, is there a need of amplify of amplification for so many singers? And indeed, it is. You really wow. have to amplificate them in a in a arena, normal arena, so twelve, thirty, forty, fifteen thousand seated arena. Yeah. And um, the the they're and they're half the arena though, aren't they? That's like Mike. That's like miking up half of the arena to point at the other half of the arena. Yes, true. <laughs> More or less. Yeah. <laughs> you said it very nice. Indeed, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as well, uh, the challenge in that production was uh, that we only had one setup day. And it's, it's, as you said, it's two balconies, it's the whole curve. Uh, and it, it is, so we had two people setting up the microphones, and that takes a long time right? because they have to run the whole, the whole day, all the stairs up and down, uh, placing some pipes and uh, so we thought of how to reduce that effort and to as well at the same time get a better sounding result. And uh, we ended up um, with uh, more or less a, an MS system uh, with a shotgun microphone. Okay. And, uh, so we could use an MS with a shotgun and we place it at three meters height and let it put it. By MS you mean mid stereo pair? Mid stereo, yeah. And yeah. we let the, it point to the last row of the block uh, where we wanted it and of course we missed the first rows and that's why we added another cardioid for the very uh, close singers yeah and uh, the good point about that was that we only had one point where we had to uh, lay down some cables and it, that made all the setup time much shorter and it was as well a better sounding mm -hmm. result than placing single Cardioid microphones everywhere. Sure, you don't want four thousand people, members of the choir, tripping over microphone cables on their way to their, to their, their spot, <laughs> Yeah, <right>? true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Timo, um, you've got a beautiful SXL in your truck. Maybe Chris can show us a photograph of you. I'm so jealous of where you. This is where I work. This is my house. This is where I work. But wait to see it. Then we're going to look at Timo's house. This is where he works, and it's very beautiful. Look at that, crikey. 
that's a 48D, right? So that's 48 faders. So are you mainly living on top of that desk? Is that, are you using uh, layouts? So layouts is a thing in an SXL where you can have any mixture of inputs and outputs on top of, of the desk and they're triggered by snapshots. Are, are you working with layouts, Timo? Yeah. Um, main thing is that I use first layout to house yeah. back. Yeah. And uh, it um, moves all, um, <clears throat> every snapshot that the whole thing in and so on. Yeah. And uh, second snapshot, uh, second layout is like strings, third is for choir, fourth is for audience and effects, fifth for supporting act, and so on. So 48 lay faders is not enough for me, so I have to use layouts, and layouts yeah. helps a lot. Layer helps a lot, right? Because in a way, in a way, I, for me, it's, it's about bringing the information up onto the surface of the console rather than digging down through too many layers. So, how, yeah, and I'm, I can see that I can understand in a broadcast world where, where you, speed is, is of the essence. You need to, a lot of faders on, on, on top there. And you quite often have two people working on that console, right? Yeah. Well, uh, for now, we have <coughs> the system that only I have mixed music with that, and uh, in the OB truck is the speech mixer. Yeah. But uh, we start a new show in September that we are first time using dual operator system. Go, yeah. Uh, okay. Where the right, right the hand is the speech mix, mixer who mixes also EVS and uh, things like that, and I mix on the left side the music. So your music on the left-hand side and then everything else to do with the production of the, the show is on the right-hand side of yeah. the desk. And you guys have worked together a long time, I think, haven't you? You've worked together for yeah, a long time. we have worked a long time. Yeah, so you, you, know how, you know how you work together. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about, um, let's talk to uh, you, you, Karsten. Let's, tell, tell me about how you lay out your desk in these, these huge shows. Um, first, I want to begin that I don't like to work with banks or layers or pages or whatever it is called. Um, and that's why the layouts is uh, thankful and in conjunction with the spill function of the VCAs. Thank okay. you for that. That's really, You're that's welcome. exactly my workflow. And uh, because you know there you have uh, other things where you have a bank which has 16 faders, but then you have the group which has, of course, 17 inputs that doesn't yeah. fit. Yeah. And that, of course, it's always like that. And I really love to work with this build function of the VCA. So I put I'm more or less in a show, I use one layout. And this is full with VCAs. And I always work with a VCA here, Rashi. And so I'm mainly mixing with uh, VCAs. Oh, yeah. And uh, so this build function. I just have press double click and then I have all the inputs in there. I have then on then on the left side of the console. Yeah. And that's the one I use. I use other layouts for sound check or for a line check. Yeah. Uh, what I always do is uh, I make a running order for my colleague on stage. Um, mm -hmm. So because when you have, imagine in Hans Zimmer, we had about uh, 160 inputs from stage. So yeah. it took, takes quite a while to check them. Um, sure. So I have a running order for my technician on stage uh, where he's walking his shortest way. And I place in the layout the microphones directly uh, one after the other exactly in the way how he's walking. And yeah. so I never forget a single microphone to be checked. And you have That's a layout for that. You have a layout for that. Yeah. I it's actually exactly a completely other world of, of kind of making up stuff. But um, as exactly what we did in radio, we, we actually rehearsed the line checks because we had, when we, we did the first version of the line check, it took about two hours for the line check and we had 20 minutes. So we had to get it down from two hours to 20 minutes. So we rehearsed it almost like a kind of, we don't want to see a ballet because, you know, there's fat roadies running about on the stage, but we rehearsed it like, like a theater piece so that we, so we got it really super fast and, and having the layouts helped, right? Because you, you weren't thinking, you were just next, 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 you know, like along the desk. Yeah, so. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it is, it is about. And that makes life easy. And do you use snapshots? Are you using the snapshots on different parts of the, of this, the show or, or are you just mixing it kind of? I, do. I love 
uh, I love mixing just <laughs> just by hand, but of course I use uh, snapshots, especially in all these uh, time code shows. And uh, it is I can change my layout if needed mm -hmm. uh, uh, with that. And of course, it's then muting, unmuting the soloists which are there and uh, not uh, mainly that. Uh, but yes, I do. I I'll, I use them, but I still love the very old way. And uh, you told me something interesting about the way that you use pan and you use your groups for pan. Just, just talk, talk to the guys through that. I found that very interesting. Yeah. Um, of course, we all know it's uh, normal intensity stereo is not possible in, uh, in venues. And uh, because you only mix for the people who can have a benefit of both arrays and the people who are sitting to the far left or far right, more or less, as soon as you use normal panorama, you have to pay them 50% of the ticket uh, back. <laughs> and uh, so what I am doing, because I had the idea, I, I was working so many times with orchestras and mixing them mono and you start to spread the first violin, you have them on the, on the far left and on the far right, but that's not a, the seating order of an orchestra. Yeah. And uh, so I was checking out, thinking of that, and uh, I came up with that I make my panorama with, uh, with uh, frequencies. Uh, so if a first violin should be locally, uh, localized on the left side, I give them with the same amount of level uh, to both speakers, but on the right side, I, de I decrease the high frequencies. So in the ground notes, all people throughout the whole venue are listening to the correct mixing levels. And, uh, but the people who are sitting in the stereo triangle, they can still listen to it stereo, oh, yeah. which is a big benefit. Yeah? And this yeah. I do with groups. This is one of the big drawbacks of mixing uh, in, in large spaces with huge line arrays is that, as you say, most of the audience are only hearing one of the line arrays. So if you use volume-based pan, then, you, you, know, you know, people are hearing half of the mix or, you know, if you pan something, it just goes louder and quieter rather than moves in, in, in the space, right? So, yeah. yeah, that's a very innovative way to do it. Well, and um, it works. It's, it's for the people inside this, uh, the triangle. It's really it's uh, it's fully fully open and uh, frequencies below 900 hertz are not decreased. They are all they are mono, uh, yeah. uh, but and the localization is done only by the overnotes. Yeah, the localization is only from from the higher end upwards as well, isn't it? You, the mm -hmm. the lower the note goes, the, the the less you can hear it localized. But wow, mm -hmm. it's cool stuff, Mark. Uh, you yes. know. Tell me some of the stuff that you were doing with, with your desk. Are, we, are you working on the layouts? Are you working with groups, VCAs? How, how, how do you organize your shows? I change my approach uh, depending on the show. So of on course. the Zorn one, I have two snapshots, one for acoustic and one for electric setups. Yeah. And then I mix the 14 bands with either of those two. Um, I always use VCA spills, like Carson said. That's also one of my go-to functions. Um, on uh, the Mike Patton show we talked about, I have a snapshot for every song, so that's a different approach. And then uh, on other shows, I use uh, layouts more intensively. I do uh, one show every year for TV and broadcast. I mixed I mixed a venue, no, I'm not in the truck, but mm -hmm. in that one we have speakers, uh, we have choir, we have orchestra, and for that I'll have layouts. I'll have an orchestra layout because they never happen together. Like, you know, the choir is separate from yeah. the orchestra, separate from the speakers. So I'll have, so that I don't have to bank around, I'll have a layout for the orchestra, a layout for all the speakers, for the guests, etc., etc. And so I live in the layout world on those. Cool. Hey, Jose Luis, I know that you use events a lot. I'm, I'm just, I just glanced at the time. I thought, shit, we're running out of time. So tell, tell it, events is uh, on the SXL, one part of the desk can trigger something else to happen on some other part of the desk. So um, Jose Luis, tell us, tell us some of the cool events that you use um, on, on your well, shows. I, I, ha I have a lot of interesting events, I think, <laughs> that could be really very interesting. But also I would like to talk about layouts and these yeah. spills before. Because I think with layouts, you can do something wonderful that is have some kind of a spill where you can keep some other important faders 
in, in the view. So I use this kind of stuff too. So because if you double hit the attention of on drums, you have the drums faders in there, but you miss a lot of information. Yeah. So what I do in a tour is, okay, I have the band group and uh, some vocals in the right side and some effects returns or sense. So I use that as a layout. So I can call drums there and I have the spill, kind of a spill drum, uh, of the drums, but at the same time I have the vocals and the main band DCA or whatever. Yeah. I think a wonderful combination. And yeah. event, uh, events, I, I do a, a lot of um, things. I don't, I don't know, I've tried, I use color, color uh, buttons to yeah. press it. Um, for the color switch at the bottom of the fader, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. And the thing is that you, you can have some more level in that channel because it's a solo, the pan goes to zero and yeah. you can add sand, sand delay just pressing a button and you don't, don't have to worry about anything. Maybe you, you have to follow the, the, um, the um, fader, of course. Yeah. But um, basically you don't have to switch on the delay and go with there. And, and the, the good thing is that you can release the button and everything goes back to the normal back position, to where it was. which is really wonderful. And even you can decide how long it takes to delay to go back or to fade so back, yeah. Simple. Yeah. I, 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 I had a look at your event. It was beautiful. So when you hold that, when you're holding down the color switch beneath yeah. a specific fader on the guitar, the guitar is normally paint, pan to one side. Uh, when you hold that switch down, it takes the pan to the center. It brings the volume up and it turns off the aux to the, to the delay, so that so the the solo has a little bit of delay on it, right? And yeah, as, for right. as long as you hold it down, and when you let it go, it goes back to the the non-solo position. Yeah, very cool. Right. It's a one-to-one. Very... One. I use another, like, some advices so, so to remember something's going to happen uh, if I have that time, time code so you can make your lamps blink in the in the desk so you know something's going to happen, like the beginning of a show or something yeah. like that. <laughs> because sometimes there is a click track for the musicians. So if there is a click track, uh, I try to record uh, in parallel a time code so it allows me to mute things or to or to um, do this kind of thing or change effects or I don't know or change the layout. I always use a main layout at the one the first dynamic as a dynamic layout and yeah. the one as a static one. Yeah. So just just for everybody at home, if you don't know the SXL, it has forty eight layouts and number one is dynamic, it changes with the snapshots so if you want it to and the other forty seven are static. They have, you, you program them and they stay with your show, yeah. yeah so right. so Mark, tell us um um, events, you got some cool events for us? Uh, not as not as cool as Jose Luis's ones. That's, that, <laughs> was, that was really cool. No, I mean, the only event that I use uh, on gigs that have time code is basically the one where you're listening for the click track. And so every time you see a level above a certain threshold, you make the console do something. And sure, in yeah. that case, it's sometimes it's flashing lights, anything to get my attention. It happens uh, on two different gigs that I've done that I didn't have the view of the musical director. In one case, it was the drummer. So, you know, I couldn't see what he was doing. In the other case, I was in a complete blind spot and couldn't see the stage at all. Mm -hmm. And so I have no idea when they're about to start a song, except for when, time, when the click track starts. Uh, and so that's the one I use the most. Okay, yeah, nice. Timo, do you use, yeah. do you use uh, events at, at all on the, on the broadcast? Uh, mainly the Pro Tools Rec Enable and Disable. Sure. Well, that's that's an important one, right? Because if, yeah. <laughs> if you're not record enabling your, your tracks, you're in trouble, yeah. So that's, that's a way to make sure that happens without you having to manually do it. The desk will yeah. do it for you. Cool. Um, I, yeah. I was just going to say, what about plugins? What plugins are you up to? Do you like Timo? Do you have a specific favorite plugins you use for, I don't know, vocals or reverbs or what well, do you like? Well, I have the uh, Sonox bundle and the Mac DSP bundle, but I really love the Arouser. The Arouser, uh, yeah. The arouser. <laughs> I like the Arouser too, apart from the name. Uh, so just for people that don't know, the Arouser is by Empirical Labs, who are the people who made the Distressor, the, the physical box that was a, the distressor was a high-end compressor, right? And they made their own plug-in version of it, which they called the arouser. And what do you, what do you use it for? I use, you use it for uh, vocals and a brass. 
Yeah. Uh, often also guitars. Because you can get a nice crunchy sound with it, right? You can add all kinds of overtones and stuff with it. Yeah. With and uh, the acoustic guitars makes a really good sound with the arousal. Yeah, yeah. I like it a lot. I use it a lot for... um. I have a kind of crutch mic and, and my drum kit, which is just a kind of ugly mic in the middle of the kit. And I put the, the arouser on it and squash it really hard. And it just adds a kind of right clang, you know, drum kit in a bedroom kind of sound for some of the Radiohead songs. So the, uh, the arouser, it, it's more than a compressor, right? It's it colors and it, it, it can, you can really mess around with that. Yeah. Karsten, plugins, mm -hmm. are, you, are you using any plugins? I kind of uh, guess it's not much. Hardly. <laughs> hardly, hardly, I was going to say. Um, so uh, what I'm using, for example, is a simple delay, for yeah. example. And that I, I do, uh, I program it with uh, the, uh, the buttons. And so, for example, when I, I always, in film music, not in classical, but in film music, I double the strings. I make a whole group of doubling the strings. And uh -huh. uh, when I have a delay with three different times on it, um, mm -hmm. uh, for example, when they're playing a ballad. but short short delay times, I'm guessing. Uh, no, not really. No, okay. <laughs> um, that's the, uh, the that's the thing. I uh, what kind of, what kind of delay for the people? Because that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. What, give us a secret. What delay times do you use then on your on your? Yeah, screen? I will tell it. It is uh, twenty uh, milliseconds, fifty milliseconds, and w up to one hundred. Wow. And uh, depending on what the strings are playing. I just press a switch. I programmed it then on the console. Yeah. If, uh, for example, a ballad where I have long notes, I use the 100 milliseconds. And then as soon as they start to play 60 notes um, on a fast song, I go to sure. 20 milliseconds. Oh. And, and that gives you a nice, that kind of just... Ball, extra touch on the strings. Yeah. Just a little bit of air around it, a little bit of space yeah, around that's it. That's it. Just a tiny nice. bit bigger. Pretty cool. Mark, what about you? What favorite plugins? Yeah, I, I base my plug-in choices on whether I'll be carrying a console or not. So if, yeah. I do, if I won't be carrying a console, I'll be sourcing it locally. Then I try to stick to the Avid plugins so I don't yeah. have to install anything when I get there or worry about has it been installed even though I've asked them to. Yeah. If I'm, use carrying the Pro, a, I'm a big fan of the Pro series. Do you use those? The multi-band, yes, multi the, the Pro compressor? Yeah. I use yeah. all of those if I'm sticking, If like I said, if it's... Uh, locally sourced console. If I'm carrying the console package, then I uh, also carry Mac DSP. I'm an endorser and I love their plugins. The yeah. Esser is one of them, one of the many I use. Yeah. Um, uh, and then EC303, do the, you use that one? I use the EC300, I think. 300, sorry. Called. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The tape delay, yeah, I use that. Yeah. Even the, their FUTS box when somebody asks me to distort things. Um, and then I use the Sonox Dynamic EQ uh, a yeah. lot. I like that plugin more than the Mac DSP's Dynamic EQ. And those are mostly, those are most of them. Jose Luis, what about you? What, what, what's your, what's your go-to plugin if you want to, I don't know, EQ something or? Well, I, I love um, Adidas as, as it is, I mean, but I, anyway, I own Asmark and Timo. Uh, and the NCDSP bundle, the Sonos bundle. Yeah. I love also the Phoenix uh, uh, from David Hill that I think sounds yeah. really wonderful for some acoustic instruments mainly. Yeah. Um, piano. And I used to use on the piano on uh, on. on yeah, that's maybe. right. Me too. Yeah. And what what we call a Spanish guitar, which is a nylon guitar, it sounds really wonderful too. And also, I am starting to experiment with some plugin alliance. Mm, plugins that I really love, but um, they don't have a bundle for, for live, I think, but anyway, they work, yeah. and they are yeah. really wonderful too. Okay, so listen, I, I can't, unbelievably, we're running out of time, right? Uh, we've, we've done an hour and a half, which is, which is insane. I, it feels like we've done about 10 minutes, because I've been so mm. fascinated by everything you've had to say. So Chris, any, any last, uh, any last, um, Questions from the crowd, but before we, we yes, we... Uh, and, and actually one that that keeps coming back. People keep asking about this uh, monitoring uh, for for classical uh -huh. orchestras, uh, wedges, in ears, side fills. Carsten's got an interesting. Carsten's got an interesting one on that. Come on, Carsten, tell us about your monitoring setup. 
Yeah. Um, on the setups where we don't have a band, uh, we try to uh, replicate uh, natural concert halls with that. And uh, what I, so normally, or what you find very often is that you give jelly to the first violins and the first violins to the jelly. And, uh, but that's not how the real world is working. Uh, the real world is when you look at a stage in a concert hall, the very last first violin player who's closest to the left wall or uh, house left, um, he hears the reflection of himself loudest. And this yeah. is our, and the reflection on the same wall of the very far away cello player, very late and uh, very silent. And that's what we try to replicate. And it's more or less, it's a bit easy. <laughs> it's and do you do that? How do you do that? Do you use on. delay? Do you do delay I, a delay, level? We use a lot of delay, yes. Yeah. And uh, as well, we, I uh, separate the, the orchestra in eight lines. Yeah. And uh, from the front to the back, there's one, one area. And I place two speakers on the left side, two speakers on the right side. And so the further the group is from the, away from the speaker, mm. the later it comes and the less level, as yeah. it is with a real uh, reverberation or real room acoustics. And that's what we try to replicate. And um, that gives a very natural feeling. Most of the time, the musicians even do not realize that it's on stage. They don't realize they're having any uh, more. They realize it when you turn it off. Yeah. Okay. Um, because that, that, they, and that, then yeah, as yeah. soon as that is, uh, the job is done very well. And uh, yeah, and it's that's beautiful. beautiful. That's yeah. a, such a simple solution, but it's it's very well thought through. It reminds me of the, the early days when, when I first actually played in bands. There was no wedges in front of you. There was just like a side for each side of the stage, and yeah, you know, you, um, it's sufficient. Yeah. Jose, and, Jose uh, Luis, when you were one, when you were working with your orchestras, were were they wearing IEMs or were they? Uh, were, were they listed in wages? Did they have any kind of monitoring? No, we usually, well, there is a, always a monitor engineer that yeah. handles that, that work. And we usually have some kind of side fields. And we, we use more or less the same technique that uh, Carson is talking about. We try to recreate the, the theme for them. And they never ask for a, a very loud levels. So that's a really very good thing, even yeah. in big places. They, they are really happy with low levels and it used to work really very well. Cool. Interesting. I hope that answers the question for the whoever asked that on the, uh, on the chat. Thanks for that question. Any other ones, Chris? Yeah, there are several. We will have to pick and choose a couple uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, virtual sound check. Let's address virtual sound check. A number of people asking, like, how do you do virtual sound checks with big orchestras? Who wants to pick that one up? Jose Luis, go for it. No, I, I think it's mm, the good thing with mm, virtual sound tech is that you always, there, there's always going, going to be some kind of rehearsal. So when they mm, leave the rehearsal, you, the, during the rehearsal, you should record everything. Even if you are still positioning some micro, microphones, yeah. at the end, you will have the whole thing there. And I think you should use that thing for the mm, final touches mm, before the, the thing, the, the final things that are right absolutely um, because you because you have you have the time you got 128 channels so you can record to and play back from and then you've got yeah. the time to just fine tune rather than just throw out the throw out the channels right yeah that's right and i think it's a must uh, it's a wonderful thing you can use to 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 have a wonderful sound Karsten, you, you, you want to talk to that too? Yeah, totally agree. And uh, it's a must to have, uh, Jose Luis, absolutely. And as well, uh, there's one very important point besides that. And this is working with the conductor. Yeah, When the conductor comes to the front of house and you can work on uh, several songs and say, hey, is it the, the right, the way I do it? Because the conductor, he cannot hear it on stage. And uh, then just ask him, please come to the front of house whenever you are insecure about a certain song, and then you can work it out. And this is such a strong benefit. Of it's, a a it's a confidence thing again, isn't it? It's, it's like you it said, it's, it's establishing a relationship. And, and, and yeah. it's a confidence thing for you as well as an engineer, you know, to have the conductor sat next to you and going, yeah, that's right, Carson, you, you, that's exactly the thing that you're doing. Or, or maybe the, the 
channels need to come up in this section or whatever. But, but you don't have to be making those decisions. The absolute expert is sat right next to you, making sure that you're, you're being true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a well, marvelous... musicians, I had situations where musicians come to me, wanted to listen to them, uh, not because of their sound, just be, yeah. just to listen from yesterday. What did I play? Mm -hmm. uh, was it right? And they want, can they have the ability of improving themselves just by working and listening to it. Uh, to it. Yeah, I've had a few points where you've been actually settling scores where two musicians have been arguing about who was in time and who was out of time. Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. play it back to them and they, go, and they can work it out between themselves. You don't have to tell them. Um, Absolutely. Very cool. And um, Timo, on, on, I guess it's on broadcast as well, virtual sound check, unbelievable tool to have, yeah? Yeah. Because you're not allowed to ask for them to rerun the show because you're, you weren't happy with the tone sound, are you? Yeah. So. In the broadcast productions, you hear the song a couple of times also, always. Yeah. So the virtual soundtrack is the must thing to have. Yeah. So you can even there reach a song before the show and not interrupting the whole production. Absolutely. I, I, I know this because, you know, the first time I mixed uh, audio for, for broadcasts and, and, and trucks like yours, um, with much smaller desks and much fewer channels and no virtual sound checks and you would have like a half of half of a run through and then you'd have a camera run through and then that, that would be it and that was that was all you got and you had no no second takes not allowed because the production moved on to something else so it must you know what a huge difference um so i'm going to ask a question i'm going to jump in and ask a, a kind of final question because um we, we run out of time, but I, I always ask this question of people on these panels because it's interesting to me, right? So, the, so I'm going to ask each one of you, how did you start in this industry? And, and for people who are watching at home and who, who are maybe, you know, starting out and hoping there is going to be an industry next year, um, and they're starting out and they're thinking about this, and this is, oh, this is an interesting way for me to go in, uh, broadcast and orchestral sound reinforcement. That's a very interesting way to my career to go. So how do you start? And uh, what would be your advice for, 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 for younger people beginning their careers? Karsten, you first. Yeah, okay. Uh, I started um, more or less the usual way. And uh, like uh, I was carrying cases for a small company. Mm -hmm. And uh, so stagehand. And uh, then I started to study medicine. And uh, in the same time I was recording uh, with my band. And that was it made it made such much more fun um <laughs> that was the decision to kick medicine and yeah. uh yeah, to cutting done up dead engineer. bodies or playing in a band yeah i can see yeah that. Yeah. yeah playing in a band is much cooler <laughs> and uh but i did not end up in a band <laughs> i ended up with orchestras uh yeah but uh, that was the way and uh as a hint for uh, for younger people um i would suppose never stick to your routines and uh, you, it's good to have routines but always ask yourself about if uh, is it right or not every day nice nice use your ears every day don't just assume that just because jose luis crespo said that on a webinar is the right way to do it right <laughs> <laughs> jose luis over to you and um, well in my case i start in this world because I think my, my father and my old brother were engineers and mm. then the next two brothers, older brothers than me, are musicians. So I have some kind of mix between engineering and mixing and, and music, music. So yeah. and that's why I, that's the way I start. I start and when I have 14, I was recording something and doing some live concerts in a crazy way because I was really very young, but I started that way and for young people, I think if they really love this stuff, is they should go for it because it's n nothing wonderful than do what you love and yeah. it should work in some uh, some way <laughs> for sure. You always seem very happy to me, Jose. Every time I ever meet you, wherever you are, whatever the situation is, you always seem really happy. You obviously love your love of mixing audio, right? Is that right? Is that a fair thing yeah, to say? Mark, what about you? How did you start? How was was you know? I was living in uh, southern Italy at the time. Um, I was about 14 and I was studying music and playing in bands. And I was kind of like the, mo the most technical or 
the most geeky, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I was the one buying a couple of microphones and recording first to tape and then buying a four track cassette tape, multi-track recorder and trying multi-track and buying a console, a small one. And for me, it, what, what kind of clicked all the boxes in engineering was the fact that I didn't have to commit to one musical genre because my, my listening habits were so wide. I was listening to rock, metal, jazz, uh, and so I formed a crossover band to try to play multiple genres, but I realized being an engineer would really let me work on multiple genres. And yeah. so I opened the studio when I was 17. And then because down here in Southern Italy, uh, back then, maybe still now, they don't really make a distinction between a live sound engineer and a studio engineer. Since I had the studio, they started calling me to mix live shows and that's how it started. And then you moved to the U.S. and your career took off. Yeah, I moved to the U.S. in uh, 99. I was 22. I had already been running my recording studio in Italy for three or four years. I just wanted to broaden my horizons. Yeah. Went to the U.S., started pouring coffee and cleaning toilets in the recording studio and worked sure. my way up from there. Good, good, man. Timo, you were, you were in a band, I believe as well when you started uh, but not talk about it, that <laughs> <laughs> main thing was that i was in a school and it was a i think it was tumblr school of arts and media and i got a mm. trainee job uh from a daily music show called yurki which okay. is like uh, much music in canada yeah know. yeah i do know much music i've done that show yeah and uh, from there, doing live shows every day, mixing yeah. and, and what would what would be your advice to, to to young people who want to get involved in broadcasting, working in your lovely OB truck because it's much cleaner and nicer than working in a gig? But what's your, what, how yeah, how do you say? Just don't. You could don't be do a doctor or lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> study harder get a proper I job I, get a real job. <laughs> I think i think we got to stop it right there chris don't you that's absolutely perfect um thank you all of you so much for for spending your time with us absolutely genius conversation um we're just going to stop the webinar and keep chatting because i'm having so much fun um nothing more to say other than it's been an absolute pleasure i hope that people at home have enjoyed it as much as, as i have listening to you guys um really appreciate it and uh you know thanks from everybody at avid uh, who helped us put this thing on and uh see you next time thanks everybody see you soon thank you that's a pleasure thank you thanks nice to meet you